Father God, we come to you this Sabbath, beautiful Sabbath morning. We thank you so much. Thank you so much for blessings that we enjoy. And we don't want to take anything for granted. We thank you for joy that you have given into our hearts. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus that we have embraced. Thank you for the truth as we find it in Jesus. Lord, this morning, as we meditate on your own words, may they bless our heart and souls. We pray in his name. Amen. This is actually the second sermon of the altogether three sermons, and I call them the trilogy of Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew. Let me tell you about this trilogy a little bit. Jesus was asked question after question in three consecutive events that took place. And Jesus answered all these three questions. First, he was asked by his disciples about the greatness. Who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? There's something within every human being that strive, strives for being better and for being the best, if you will. Striving for excellence. That's the first question. And Jesus answered that question. Immediately after this, he, he was asked the second question, and the question was about love. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So the first one is about greatness. The second one is about marriage, love in marriage. And the third one, the third and the last question was about how do we have good life? How do we have good life? And including in that, included in that good life, eternal life. Good trilogy, isn't it? Greatness, love in marriage, and how can we have a good life? And what is interesting about this, these were questions one after the other, event after the event. So I call it the trilogy from the Gospel of Matthew. So I'm going to cover second in the series, which is on marriage. Jesus was asked on this, uh, on this topic of love, uh, the question was being formulated in a very negative way. And here is the way. He was asked by Pharisees, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? For something that is meant for love, care, and flourishing ends up this way. In divorce. And how can I get out of this marriage? So the question, instead of being positively formulated, it's negatively formulated. And Pharisees are asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? This is what we are going to cover today. Okay. The answer that Jesus gives, first and foremost, it's Bible-based. Jesus gives Bible-based answer. Number two, he gives a positive answer. It's really important, positive answer. And he gives a formula for a good marriage. Don't you like that? He goes to the authority behind marriage, goes to the Word of God and says, let me tell you about what good marriage is. Then he gives a positive answer. Because remember, it was formulated negatively. And then he ends up by telling them the formula for good marriage. So, this sermon is for you who are married. This sermon is for you who are unmarried or not married and are on your way to get married. And a third one, for those who are uncertain and who have been burnt in marriage. So for all of you, for all of us. Okay? So let's get into it. Jesus, to the question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for whatever reason, Jesus goes and starts 
with giving a biblical answer. You see, when you're answering important questions in life, they should be found in the Bible. Yeah? Okay. So Jesus starts by saying, have you not what? Read. Have you not read? How is your reading of the Bible? Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Have you not what? Read. Seven times in the New Testament, Jesus would use this statement, Have you not read? So he would challenge his people, people of the book. And he would say to them, have you not read? This is exclusively Jesus' expression. We don't find anyone in the New Testament or actually in the, in, the, in the Gospels who is saying these words. Have you not read? Jesus' exclusive expression, seven times used. Let me show you some of the occasions when Jesus used this expression. He used this expression in relation to creation. Have you not read? In relation to marriage. Have you not read? In relation to Sabbath. Have you not read? In relation to resurrection. Have you not read? In relation to himself. Have you not read? All, all that is important. All that is important is found in the word of God. Creation, marriage, Sabbath, resurrection, himself, all is rooted in the word of God. So, when Jesus said, have you not read, he's basically saying, subject yourself to the authority of the Bible on very important issues. Subject yourself to the word of God. Creation, salvation, Sabbath, marriage, resurrection, anything that it tells you, it gives you as an authority. And you and I are to subject ourselves to it. Yes? And number two, we are to come to the point of therefore, a firm conviction of what the word of God is authoritatively and convincing, convincingly telling us. We are supposed to read the Bible prayerfully, intelligently, expecting that the Spirit of God will illuminate us. So today we are talking about marriage. Read. Read from the original source about marriage. So that's what we are going to do today. And let the Word of God become the authority. Whenever you take any other book, you can say, ah, maybe, and put it aside. But when you come to the Word of God, you can't say, ah, and put it aside. When you come to the Word of God, you subject yourself to what it says. Not only that, you are asking that you be illuminated at the level of your mind to understand what it says, why it says it. Because it is for your good and for my good. So, what we are encouraged by Jesus in the most fundamental way is read. Read. Meditate on what it says. Understand what it says. And accept and apply. Have you not what? Have you not Read. Have you not read? The Bible is to be read in such a way that we are often caught by surprise. Let me share one with you. Have you not read about David who took bread which only priests were supposed to take? In other words, if you are reading this event and you are not surprised, then you are not reading it properly. Because if you are reading this event and you see that David, who is not a priest, is eating from the food that is found in the temple, you say... You're scratching your head and you're saying, this is not right. So if you're reading the Bible and nothing you find in there that does not intrigue you, surprise you, uh, motivate you, 
then you're not reading the Bible at all. That's why Jesus would say, have you not read? Come to understand. Come to be surprised. Come to cry. Bible is there to hit you at the level of your mind and the level of your heart. Have you not read? Especially in relationship to marriage. Have you not read? So this is the basic question before we get into the topic of marriage. And that is, have you stopped to give Bible its authority in your life? And the reason you have done it is because you cease to read, meditate, and understand and apply. Let me, let me give you a personal conviction, confession. I find no other book that stimulates me to the deepest level than the Word of God. Nothing, nothing compares to it. We need to come to the point where Jesus, seven times perfectly, if you will, would say, have you not read? He's encouraging us to be people of the word, people of the book. Bible is to inform and then to shape the way we think, feel, and behave. You and I will be, will be the most illuminated people on planet earth if we learn to read and meditate on the word of God. On any topic, on any subject, but especially this one. Especially this one. That is the first aspect of what Jesus said. Have you not read? But the second one is equally important. Jesus gives a positive answer to a negatively formulated question. What was the question? What was the question? Anyone? What was the question? Is it what? Lawful for a man to what? To divorce his wife. For whatever reason. That was the question. But in his answer to this negative question, Jesus says, when asked about divorce, Jesus answered with marriage. Do you see that? Jesus doesn't go and starts to talk about the, the good reasons for divorce. He says, no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not going to talk about divorce. I'm going to talk about the original. I'm going to talk about marriage. Do you see the difference? Very often as a pastor, I, I am faced with, with people and couples who come to me very often very late. And all they are interested is like Pharisees. How can we get separated and divorced? We are the beyond the point of redemption. Jesus says, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before divorce, it's about marriage. It's about marriage. I want you to see this important principle. We can be fixated on problems and negatives and lose sight of what? Solutions and positives. Isn't that true? We are silly human beings, aren't we? Very silly. There is something about human nature that is fixated with negatives. Fixated with problems. And we are churning them in our heads. We are churning them in our conversations. And we are just talking about negatives. And what you think is what you become. Do you see that? So when asked about divorce, Jesus said, hold on. I will tell you about marriage. I will tell you about marriage. Let's focus on the original, Jesus says, and on marriage first, rather than how fake it became. Because that's what you hear. From people who start to suffer in their marriages. It becomes kind of fake. And not what it is meant to be. What it is meant to be. So the principle at work is this. 
if you are to deal with the problem of injustice, let's say, focus first on justice. If you are to deal with the problem of hate, focus on love. If you are to deal with the problem of fake, focus on the original. If you are to deal with the problem of consequences, go to what was the cause of those problems. If you are to deal with the problem of divorce, look at what marriage is first. So let's go and read what Jesus said. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. I want you to see, Jesus is telling them about marriage. Can you see that? And there's so much he packed into this. And they interrupt him. And they said, hey, you didn't hear us. We don't want to listen about marriage. We want to hear about divorce. He's interrupted. He's interrupted. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Jesus, don't talk to us about marriage. Talk to us about divorce. He said, he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, so Jesus gets back to his point. But from the beginning, it was not so. They're saying to Jesus, we haven't come here to talk about original, about positive, about causes, about marriage. We are here to talk about fake, about negatives, about our reality, about divorce. Be very careful. I want you to see the principle. Do you see it? Very often, we as people just keep chasing our tails. Keep chasing our tails. And Jesus is there as a circuit breaker. And says, okay, let me tell you about the original because that's a solution. That's a solution. Beautiful rain. Can you hear me outside? Yeah. So Jesus insists on original, on positive, on causes, on marriage. Jesus' answer, he insists on softening of heart rather than the hardening of heart. Pharisees are all about, okay, let's talk about divorce. Jesus said, no, let's talk about marriage. But here is a question. But how? How do we keep and stay in the plan, in God's original plan, or what marriage and how marriage is supposed to look like? Which brings us finally to Jesus' formula on good marriage. Number one principle. If you want your marriage to prosper, it is firstly about God of marriage. That's number one principle. If you want your marriage to prosper, it is not about your spouse. Did you hear what I just said? First fundamental principle is if you want your marriage to prosper, it is not primarily about your spouse, but about God of marriage. Look what it says. Haven't you read, he 
he replied that at the beginning, the creator, because God first imagined marriage. God made marriage of two, not two, but three. So it is God and you and your spouse. That's marriage. Let's not talk about divorce, Jesus said. Let's talk about original. And number one principle is about the one who imagined it. Because he is the one who knows what kind of marriage will prosper. So what's number one principle? It's not about the spouse within your marriage. It's about God of your marriage. What about it? What about it? It's love relationship between God as a foundation. So we are to be exposed to the love of God. First and foremost. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In other words, we are to be exposed to the love of God. If our marriage is to prosper. Be exposed, exposed, exposed daily to the love of God in your personal life. But also, love your God in return. That is putting foundation on you, of your marriage on the right foundation. Do you see that? So the first formula... First principle of the first formula for the successful marriage is not about your spouse. It's not about your boyfriend. It's about God of relationship and your personal relationship to him where you are receiving love from God and where you are returning that love for God. You are, by doing that, you are placing a proper foundation for relationship with your spouse for relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Don't work on that relationship first. Work on a relationship with God first. Does it make sense? Haven't you read in the beginning, creator of marriage? Number one. Tragedy of humanity at the fall and strained marriage of Adam and Eve happened because of a broken relationship with God. Did you realize that? I want you to see that that is so clear when you read the first story of the fall. Did you observe that Adam blamed Eve? Did you observe that? Did you observe that as a consequence, the relationship was strained? But do you observe also that the root problem of this blaming of Adam was his broken relationship with God? It's nothing to do with Eve. Did you see that? There, he's blaming her, but his primary problem is not broken relationship with her. The primary problem is his broken relationship with God. So often when you are trying to fix your problems, you don't even realize that behind your problem that you have as spouses is your broken relationship with God. So don't try to fix that one first. Try to fix this one first. Do you see that? It is clear as crystal in the original story of the fall. Therefore, principle number one is God of marriage, then your spouse within a marriage. We will fix many problems within our marriages and with our, within our relationships when we fix the most fundamental one, which is our relationship with God. I didn't hear amen. Do we get it? Do we understand that? I see couples chasing their tails. And problems continue to abound. And none of them have fixed their primary problem. And as soon, and I've seen this so many times, as soon as they have come back to God, 
for whatever magic reason, their marriage is fixed. Have you observed that? I've seen that many times. Something happened. Something happened. It's about cause and consequences. So that's number one principle. So Jesus said, have you not read? Have you not read about creator in the beginning? Number two principle, it is about love and marriage between male and female. He who created them from the beginning made the male and female. It's about love and marriage between male and female, as we said. Loving your spouse and being loved by your spouse. It's both. So we said, number one, love of God and love for God. Number two, love for your spouse and expecting the love in return. But always remember that you need to be a giver of love before you're expecting to get that love in return. You are the giver of love. God is first the giver of love on which we depend. And in your marriage, I speak to you, especially guys. Because the Bible says, love your wives. Somehow, for some reason, God is saying to us, you initiate and be the giver of love. Especially men. I didn't hear amen. I'm, 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 I'm sucking it out of you. But it's true. It's true. Be the giver of love and fill the cup of your spouse. That's principle number two. Okay? And also receive the love from the other. Very often in marriage... Another spouse stops giving because they say, I just constantly give and I'm not receiving. And especially men, this is given to us from the, from the New Testament we find. Where, and the Jesus says, love your wife, love your wife, love your wife. Be initiator, be initiator. What we also find as a principle here is that love in marriage is between male and female. In the beginning, I want you to see this. This is really peculiar. This is what I said to you. Whenever you read, you have to be always surprised when you read the Bible. If you don't, you're not reading it. You're not reading it. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. Isn't that how the Bible starts? Today is Sabbath, and you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> but this is a surprise now. He who created them from the beginning made the male and female. Do you see how the Bible starts? In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. And Jesus, when he speaks about the marriage, he calls it the beginning. In the beginning, God created the male and female. Okay. From creation till the time of Jesus, marriage has always been between male and female. This is what the culture will not tell you. This is what the culture will not preach. But this is what the culture will be not happy about to hear. And by Jesus saying that in the beginning God created male and female, he's basically saying from this time on exactly the same thing. So we'll live under the mandate of creation which Jesus blesses when he comes. Let me just address it within a culture that we are part of. Think about it. 
in a Jewish culture, Jesus didn't even have to say this, and it would be understood without any shadow of doubt. Because Jewish culture of that time, and really until recently, you didn't need to say male and female. It was taken for granted, but it's as if we need to hear it this today in our own culture. But let me share with you the principles behind this, and they are important. Please follow me on this. In the story of creation, you have the principle of binaries. You know what the binaries are? Go away. You know what the binaries are? Hey? No? Binaries. What is binary? Opposites. You know how we say opposites what? Attract. Attract. I was doing this. That means that's not attracting. So opposite attract. So that's binary. Like light and darkness. Opposite. Yeah? So constantly in the book of Genesis, in the account of creation, you have these opposites that attract. But you also have opposites that are there to separate. And this is an important principle, and I want you to see very carefully. The principle of attraction between binaries. Creator and creature. Yeah? You have a creator God, and then he creates creation, and he, he made us in his own image. That's a binary. Creator and creature. There is another one. Male and female. Yeah? And there is another one. Savior and sinner. Do you see the binaries? Aren't you glad that this binary of Savior and sinner is so important? That God loved us so much that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Binaries. We are saved because of the binaries. That God did not abandon us. But was drawn to us even though we were sinners. That's number two principle. Number three principle is this one. Leaving father and mother and creating a family. That's number three. And this is so clear. And in my, in my pastoral practice, I have observed this. That the proper leaving does not happen. And therefore, the proper cleaving or joining does not happen. In other words, one of the spouses can be so attached to their family that they are incapable of creating their own. So when, for, when family is created, when you have husband, wife, and children, that's what it is meant to be. Go and multiply, flourishing, family. It is always meant to be in, done in such a way that those kids eventually will grow up and leave the nest. Leave. Leave. So that by leaving, they will find their spouse and cleave to their spouse. And then they themselves will form the family. And so this cycle goes on. This cycle goes on. This is the cycle of prosperity. And this is the cycle that can only happen between male and female, between husband and wife. Otherwise, any other is dead. End.
That's number three principle that we find in the text. Jesus says, let me not talk to you about divorce. Let me talk to you about what? About marriage. What's the first principle? What's number one principle we said? It's about God or marriage, not your spouse. What's number two? Love for your spouse. And love of your spouse. And it is love between male and female within a marriage. Because it's about binaries that attract. That is the formula of creation. That was the original. Never changed. And now number four. It's about joining together in unbreakable lifelong bond. And therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they shall become what? One. One flesh. It's about minimizing separateness and maximizing togetherness. It's about minimizing separateness and maximizing togetherness. That's what it says. They will join. Okay. This is a formula for disaster. When couples have separate friends, they have separate accounts, they have separate interests, they have separate beds. That's a formula for disaster. Jesus says they will join together. And this joining is not just the joining of body. It's a joining of mind, joining of heart, joining of life. And therefore, common friends, common interests, common joint accounts, one bed. It can be king or queen. It doesn't matter. Oh, it may matter, actually. It depends on your size. But it is one bed. Or if you put two single together. But that's what Bible is really saying. You see how important it is to feed on every word. You know, remember when Jesus said, you are to feed on every single word that comes from my mouth. We have to take all the juice. I'm not going to tell you about what? Divorce. I'm going to tell you about what? About marriage. That's what it is. Do you see how from the word of God we find that we are not to, we have to minimize separateness and maximize togetherness? So it has to be common friends, joint accounts, common interests, same bed. So Jesus' formula for good marriage, love of God and love for God as the center of your marriage, number one. Number two, love between male and female who form the bond of marriage. Number three, leaving parents to form marriage bond and family. And number four, joining together by minimizing separateness and maximizing togetherness. This is a beautiful Part of Jesus' trilogy on greatness, this one is on love. This one is on love. Have you not read? Have you not read? Go to the original and stay with the original. Your marriage will become fake. And the reason of the, for the fakeness of your marriage is because you have stopped reading, meditating, applying those principles that Jesus has given us. This is where I would say amen. What about you? Amen. amen.